We're fixing to get started. But here's the thing. Y'all are way too far away. I do an intimate show, and I need to be able to reach out and touch someone. I'd really appreciate it if you all pick up your chairs and move on up here where I can talk to you in an appropriate and intimate fashion. Yeah. Yeah, come on up. Now, Mom, it's so much better this way. I wish, really appreciate it if everybody come on up. It makes, it makes for a lot better time. Okay, y'all, are we gonna start? Are we ready? Sound guy ready? We all, are we all ship shape here? Yeah, let's make sure everybody's operant. Doing music in the 19th century was a lot easier when there wasn't any electricity. <laughs> and you didn't have to worry about all this garbage and wires and plugs and blah, blah, blah. I've often wished. So now, is everybody all, Jack, you all wired up? Yeah? You're all, yeah? <clears throat> okay, here's the deal. This is gay country, right? When, I'm gonna take my glasses off because there's a glare. I hope my husband reminds me where they are. I'd be uh, sunk without, yeah, Bob, take my glasses and put them in your hip pocket or something. Okay, so <clears throat> this is gay country and when you see think gay, you think about sex, right? Duh, right? So I'm gonna sing about gay sex, let's go. Every sense I tried your way. Go 
Nelly, like a Nelly on Chanel. You take a little beard and Sex is fun sex. Um, I, I talk a lot during my gigs. Because, because num number one, I'm a chatty Kathy. But number two, it's about our history. And I kind of take you down memory lane, giving you stories about where we came from. So um, I had a really significant first in 1966. A first that changed my the whole trajectory of my life. Because in 1966, I was the very first person in the world to be kicked out of the American Peace Corps for sucking dick. <laughs> right? Thank you, thank you. That's my, ti that's my tiara. I wear it proudly wherever I go. They say you can't take it with you, but I'm taking that tiara with me. Kelly, if you happen to be at my memorial, make sure that it could be into the fire with me, right? I'm taking it with me. That's my tiara. It hurt at the time. It was very painful. So, what do you do when you're really hurting? And you go to your mom and you say, Mom, I'm really hurting. And she says, well, let me take you to the doctor. So I go to the doctor and I tell the doctor, I'm really hurting. So the doctor says, I think he's a queer. That's a mental illness. So, take him to Stellicum. <laughs> so, you all know where Stellicum is, right? Right down the road, the state mental hospital. Fuck. 
I'm sit, sitting in a fucking stillicum trying to figure out what's going on, right? And some angel in that hospital, and I don't know who she was and I don't know where she came from, I think she came from the spirit world. She came up to me and she said, honey, you're not sick, you're gay. There's a difference. You don't belong here. You don't have a mental illness. Nobody here can help you. Get out of here. It's hopeless here. Go, go, there's a door. You're a voluntary commitment. Just walk out the door. Nobody here can help you. I said, well, what should I do? And she said, you're a very clever fellow. You can figure it out yourself. But you're not sick. You're gay. Oh. <laughs> well, if I'm not sick, let me get the fuck out of here, right? <laughs> so I left. I buried my records, and I went over to the other side of the state to Spokane, and I got a job as a psychiatric caseworker. <laughs> three, three weeks after I walked out of the hospital, I said, oh yeah, I got this. <laughs> I, got, I got this. <laughs> yeah. And all of my uh, peers were complimenting me because they couldn't imagine where I got all that empathy. I was so empathetic. Duh! <laughs> Get a clue. Those were terrifying years for me. It was pre Stonewall. There was one gay bar in Spokane. And it wasn't disco balls and all that shit. It was like pre-Stonewall, pre-Donna Summers. It was about uh, five times as big as a postage stamp. It was dirty. It was grungy. It was a hellhole. It had no windows. It had no neon lights. It had one plain gray door that you snuck through hoping the police weren't looking or the people that you worked with weren't looking. But they were looking so they could rip your ass, tell your, call your wife or call your boss or whatever and get you in trouble because you are a dick lick. It was an ugly place. I don't even remember the name of it. I don't want to remember the name of it. Um, but I wrote a song about it. And it's not uh, lively and upbeat, <laughs> but it's the truth. And so here's a song about my experiences in that gay bar in Spokane, pre-Stonewall. Yeah, I'm, pre I'm a pre-Stonewall faggot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, some of us came from the Neolithic. Okay, I'm gonna, so I'm going to sing you a song about it because it's important to remember where we came from. Right? That's the whole point of the song. It's called Gay Bar Blues. Let's do it, Jacko.
I did move home to Missoula, and I did date Susie Q from high school. And sure enough, it was a complete catastrophe. Uh, I was in Missoula in 1969, June, when the Stonewall riots happened. And I just couldn't stand it one more minute. So I came out in Missoula, Montana in 1969 with the bikers and the cowboys. <clears throat> that was a little dicey, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I have some stories about that, but I won't tell them. Um, but yeah, I came out in Missoula in 1969, and um, it was very liberating, even though it was Missoula. I had, I had, a, I actually had a great time. Uh, because I was free. I went to uh, Seattle to uh, go to graduate school to learn how to be a better psychiatric caseworker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there I met the gay liberation movement and a bunch of radicals. And uh, there was a sh coffee house 
here in, in Tacoma called the Shelter Half Coffee House. And I started doing work in the anti-war coffee house. And mostly, yeah, mostly working with the issue of gays in the military, which was a very dicey issue at that time. We did a Jane Fonda show, <laughs> and I was doing gay activist work, and I had a really nice group of radical leftists supporting me. And Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland, they didn't want to say gay at the show. <laughs> and finally, <laughs> Somebody in the crew who like had the contract in his name for the show said, if you don't say gay, I'm going to pull this contract. <laughs> so poor Jane Fonda had to get up on the stage and say gay. <laughs> that was fun. And I'd like to introduce two of my close comrades from that time, Kelly and Robert Radford, who were, and Colleen, <laughs> Kelly's mother, Colleen. Yeah, stand up and take a bow. You were in the Shelter Half Coffee House doing that work in 1970, 71 to 72. And the very first Lavender Country show I ever put on was at the Shelter Half Coffee House, right? So this is a very special moment for me to be singing in Tacoma and to have the Radfords and Colleen's with me. We go back. <laughs> next year will be the <clears throat> next year will be the fiftieth anniversary of Lavender Country. So that's how far back we go, 50 fucking years. So one thing led to another, and uh, I was turning in, I have to thank the Peace Corps for kicking me out. Because when I went into the Peace Corps, I was a tenant farmer's kid, but I was stuck up, and I was petty bourgeois aspirant, and I was a middle-of-the-road Democrat. And after I got kicked out of the Peace Corps and got introduced to the Radfords and the Jane Fonda Show and the radicals that were hanging out in Tacoma, I transformed myself rapidly from a petty bourgeois Democrat into a screaming Marxist bitch, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so, I've, I've been that my whole life. And uh, I, lived my, I lived my life as a screaming Marxist bitch, and I screamed all over. Um, and Keep screaming. Can you imagine me as a petty bourgeois Democrat? <laughs> oh my God. That, that would have been really hideous and really boring. Um, but anyway, I didn't do that. I, radicalized myself and I've been a socialist revolutionary ever since for bad or good right <clears throat> what do you do when you turn yourself into a screaming Marxist bitch in 1972 you jump on an airplane and you go cut cane for Castro in Cuba that's what I did right and I learned a lot about socialism there. And we formed a gay caucus there. And in 1972, forming a gay caucus in Cuba was dicey. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't really any worse than it was in Kansas City. They just called us different names, like running dog lackey of the ruling class and bourgeois degenerate and shit like that. And the line was, if you were gay, you weren't part of the working class. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I know, it's twisted, right? But that was the line. And I'm, hey, I grew up on a tenant dairy farm, you know, up on the Olympic Peninsula, west of Port Angeles, and with a poor mom and a poor dad and 11 brothers and sisters. And I was doing the work of a full-grown man when I was fucking 10 years old. I mean, I was flipping bales that weighed more than I did up in the air, hundreds at a time. And when somebody told me in Cuba that I wasn't part of the working class, it really pissed me off. Because, <laughs> because I was doing the work of a full-grown man at age 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 or what it was really insulting so I wrote a song about it and the point of the song is the whole reason that that we get put that shit on us is because they have these lines to divide us from one another in the working class if you're an immigrant, you're not one of us. If you're a woman, you're less than. If you're transgender, you're not whatever. To take the focus off of us uniting as a class and dividing us and having us fight one another. You lick dick, so you're not it. You have a vagina, so you're not it. You want a vagina, but you don't have one, so you're not it. Whatever. Just a bunch of hooey and hogwash and crap to keep us fighting one another while they rob us blind, right? <laughs> we have to get over that shit. And so I wrote a song about it. And it's about uh, not making those divisions in the working class. So it's, it's about gay men, but you all have your manifestations of how you're oppressed. Right? <laughs> so just fill in, you can fill in the blank, right? Just fill it in and you'll get the point. So let's do is the song's called Back in the Closet Again. I'm back in the closet again.
They think you guys are sick And all you want's a dick While we fought pigs stole the whole damn fight So that was the end of the revolution, my friend Now all of us is going to the camp That's what that's about. Uh, no more divisions. Say what? I can't hear you, honey. Come up. Oh, we got a T-shirt. Yeah, we got a back in the closet T-shirt. I have to take my hearing aids out so I can do this band, and so when somebody talks to me, I go, huh, huh. That's what happens when you start a music career at age 70. But, but let's move on. So we live in a culture that spoon feeds us sex, commercializes sex. And, you know, they make a lot of money. The capitalists make a lot of money commercializing sex. And... Uh, it puts us in a position where it's very difficult for us to figure out what the difference is between hot sex and real intimacy. Uh, and <clears throat> when Stonewall happened, the gay men who came out were all like under 30. Because if you were over 30, you were too far in to get out. You know, you had a mortgage, maybe you had kids, you had a job you couldn't leave. All kinds of reasons you had to stay in the closet. So most of us were under 30 because that's who could afford to come out. So that meant a few things. It meant, number one, that we were young. And number two, it meant we were stupid. <laughs> and number three, it meant we were horny. <laughs> So as soon as we hit the streets, the next thing that we figured out was how we could fuck one another with glee and alacrity all night long. Three, four, five partners at a night and then go out the next night and have some more partners. And then at the weekend, just go hog wild. And that, that was all right. There was nothing wrong with that. It was sexual liberation time. And, it was our manifestation of sexual liberation. And I was part of that, just like the rest of them. I, I was part of that. All right, I was queen of the bathhouse sluts for 20 years, okay? <laughs> yes, I was. And again, there wasn't anything wrong with that. I was stacking them up like cordwood for 30, 20 years in the, in the bathhouses and in the streets and in the bathrooms and in the alleys. And 
Well, I won't tell you all the places, but you get the idea, right? <clears throat> there wasn't anything wrong with me having sex with a lot of men. But, uh, but there was something wrong. And that was while I was in the bathhouse stacking up beefcake like cordwood for 20 years, the whole time I was wondering why nobody loved me. Okay, that's, that's kinky, right? That is, that is some twisted shit. To have sex with 5,000 men and wonder why nobody loves you? Now that's a trip. That's a trip. And a lot of us were caught up in that. And, um, you know, they, ta they taught us to feel bad about ourselves. That's what Max Factor does. Makes you feel bad about yourself, so you'll buy some goop and put it on your face and think that you're more beautiful. And then you look in the mirror and sure enough, you're not any more beautiful. So you go back to the drugstore and you buy some other shit to put on your face, hoping that will make you beautiful. And nothing makes you beautiful. And I wasn't beautiful. I wasn't a hunk. I was only five foot five. You know, my nose was too big, my dick was too short, whatever. I wasn't good enough. We all, got, we all suffer from that shit under capitalism. They teach us to feel bad about our bodies so that they can sell us shit. And it's all just, just all a bunch of crap. And we were all beautiful before we went into the drugstore to buy that lipstick or whatever it was. We were all fucking gorgeous in the first place, right? So I spent a lot of time thinking that I wasn't beautiful. But I am. <laughs> yeah. 78 years old and just hot, hot, hot. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I wrote a song about that. About trying to figure out the difference between hot sex and real intimacy. And we had a lot of trouble with that. I had a lot of trouble with that. We all did. And we're not the only community who suffers from that syndrome. I'm going to sing a song. It's called I Can't Shake the Stranger Out of You. And it's a really pretty song. You'll like it, and it has a point.
jumping while your lips are chomping at the bed. I'll kiss you, but who's gonna miss you when you're chasing midnight through? I'd be glad to be your one-shot pleasure, even leave you grieving at your leisure bed. But I can't shake the stranger out of you. Go ahead, Jacko. That's a good song to cut a rug on, yeah? So I finally figured out that the basic problem with why nobody loved me was because I didn't love myself, right? First and foremost, I, I didn't love myself. So when I figured that out, okay, you're gonna love yourself and have a nice life anyway, even though nobody loves you. You have to love yourself first, Patrick. And I, I, I got that down. And when I did, intimacy hit me square in the face. <laughs> Scared the hell out of me. Uh, and I opened the door and I met a man who knew what true intimacy was. And he gave it to me. And it turned out he was a lovely, lovely man who wrote the book on generosity and devotion. And he's my man and I love him so, and he's here tonight. There he is. Julius Broughton. Yeah. Yeah, there he is. 35 years. Yeah. 30. 35 years we've been together. Come on up here, honey. I'm going to sing you a love song. So this is, this is, for, this is for my man. <laughs> okay. 35 years, honey. You should have thrown me out a long time ago. Have I told
that's, that's it. You're welcome, baby doll. I love you to the moon, to Jupiter, to beyond Jupiter. It's hard to get through that song without crying, right? <laughs> um, what do we got next, Jack? Oh, Clara? Clara? Well, this, uh, sure enough, this song requires another little chat. So, <laughs> uh, everybody's calling me an elder these days. I'm like, looking around. <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> what the fuck do you mean, elder? <laughs> uh, but here's a, here's a scoop on that. The Stonewall activists turned into the first elders that the lesbian gay community ever had. Before Stonewall, we didn't have elders. After we lost our sexual capital, i.e. after Max Factor decided we weren't beautiful anymore. When we lost our sexual capital, we just melted into the woodwork and disappeared. And we weren't available to the younger ones to be elders. So our generation is the first generation that's being honored and acknowledged as elders, right? So, I'm trying to figure out how to do that the best way I know. The best way I know. But, uh, <clears throat> it's very important. Every community that's ever existed in the world has had elders, right? To look up to and venerate and honor. And so um, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. But when I was 25, I had my own elders. And I had an elder who was much older than me. I was 25, she was like 55. And her name was Clara Fraser. And Clara was a Marxist, Leninist, Socialist, Feminist, Trotskyist, right? And if you're a Marxist, Leninist, Socialist, Feminist, Trotskyist, in the 1950s when McCarthy was running around chopping off your head, you had to be tougher than double out Niles, right? You had to be able to spit it out. You had to be, you had to be pushy, real pushy. Yes. And Clara was, Clara Fraser was, all that. And she taught me, well, she put me in a finishing school to learn all I needed to know about being a screaming Marxist bitch. Because she was really a good screaming Marxist bitch. Top notch. Seattle City Light hired her to do a women in the trades program. You know, women up the flagpole, fix the lines, blah, blah, blah. So Clara hired a bunch of dykes, duh, <laughs> to uh, initiate that program with her. And as soon as management figured out that the women could climb the pole as fast as the men, and that they could fix the electric lines as fast as the men. And number three, they didn't have dick fights with one another on the job. <clears throat> Ahem. Then the management got really upset. And she had a boss named Gordon Vickery. And Gordon Vickery was a hick, uh, old school, proto-fascist numbnuts. And uh, he, had an, he had an assistant named Carol Coe, who was a, a blonde bombshell, anti-feminist. <laughs> you know, smile on your face, stab you in the back. I see the women in the room, the eyes are lighting up with that knowing look, right? <laughs> Carol Coe was one of those, she was an anti-feminist. And Gordon Vickery and Carol decided to embark on a plot to fire Clara. And they did. And that was a big mistake because the day after she got fired, Clara got on the radio and started dumping all the shit that City Light had pulled on all these women. All the cat calls, all the quote accidents, all the mean things, all the beatings, all the rapes. 
that had happened on the job. She just screamed it to the whole world. And she filed suit, and the suit went on and on, and she won a bunch of money, and she gave it all back to the movement, and Gordon Vickery, um, somehow he had an early retirement. And <laughs> Carol Coe, um, well, she needed to find another job, let us put it that way. So I wrote a song for Clara, because I was working with Clara, and she was, I was her under, one of her understudies. And uh, I didn't write it from Clara's point of view, and I didn't write it from my point of view. I wrote it from Gordon Vickery's point of view about why he had to fire Clara. So pretend I'm a proto-fascist numbnuts for a minute. And, uh, and I'm going to sing you a song about why Gordon Vickery fired Clara. And it's important for you to know that every single line in the song, whether an event or a quote, is the absolute fundamental truth. Every single line is a true story about what happened to her on the job. So that's enough rapping. Let's sing Claire Fraser. <laughs> the trainee by the name of Megan Cornyn. Let's say the chair of your employee rights committee is a Trotskyite and a Marxist albatross. She nixed my affirmative action plan. She cut my throat on a witness stand. Miss Cole, you got to show her Walked 
a song that sank Lavender Country into the depths of hell for 30 years. It was this next song. It was the one that really put me on the outs with Nashville and everybody else. The song that made it impossible for anybody else to sing with me. Anything. And it was also the song that somebody put on YouTube in 2014 and shot Lavender Country out of the gutter into the... (laughs) Stratosphere. Uh, Now, this song is about a straight white supremacy and the people who are trying to voice that down our throats again. Now, I realize that there are men in the audience who, yeah, Robert, you're a man. It's also... You're of a heterosexual persuasion. I happen to know that about you. You know? You're... Here's the thing. It's not your fault, Bob. You were born that way. It's not your fault. How you were born, it only matters what's in your head now. And you can't change who you're sexually attracted to. I certainly couldn't. God knows I tried. (laughs) So if you happen to be of the heterosexual persuasion and you're in the audience, I just want you to know I'm not singing about you. You know, you're not to blame. You were born that way. It's not your fault. I can't help it if you're wired wrong. It's not... (laughs) It's not your fault. It only matters what you're thinking now. So um, here we go. We're going to sing this song. It's got a great tagline. And the tagline is, Crying these cocksucking tears. And... Uh, First time in a kid. Anybody want a Viennese waltz? It's a great Viennese waltz. i 
liars can't deceive me I know that you'll leave me Crying these cocks against you <laughs> By now, you have guessed I'm not too impressed With your talents as an engineer You build up your steeple And you rivet more people To keep it erect Victories ain't won it Long as I'm haunted With crying these cocks sucking tears Donald and all of his rich bums, blood-sucking bums. They actually think because they have white skin and a penis and they always put their penis in a vagina that that means they're better than us. Um, can we check out the science here? Uh, does that make any kind of sense? They have white skin and a penis and they always put it in a vagina so they get to oppress all the rest of us. No. Huh? No. <laughs> Mary, I don't think so. Um, we're going to sing you the opposite of that. We're going to sing you a song about revolution. Yeah. <clears throat> this song is uh, 
the backbone of the Lavender Country album. And uh, it's the time when I get down off the stage. Do I say what? Oh no, I I don't I know that. But I don't want to walk. This is, this is a song that I really want you to remember because it's really the backbone of my whole political message. And this is also the song where my fabulous husband, who can dance a lot better than me, is going to show you how to gyrate. So this is a time when everybody gets up and we're going to dance our asses off. Yeah. 
sure had guts to go cruising rednecks on a starry night. Damn gone rose, he never fought. Sure too bad that he forgot. Stomping queers is their God-given right. We were pissed off when they grabbed him. Pissed off when they stabbed him. He didn't quit with the stick and said, Behave in the doctors and nurses. Grabbed and jabbed him. The more It's crying from an angry way Let's not just talk about revolution Don't give in, leave pound for pound There's just no end to the pollution Rise up and rip this goddamn system down there ain't no hope to the top of the ground Let's not just talk about revolution Don't defend me pound for pound There's just no end to the pollution Rise up and rip this goddamn system down there ain't no hope to the temples to the ground Yeah Yeah I told you I was a screaming Marxist bitch I told you that I told you that coming in So there's a song from a screaming Marxist bitch Um you know, I heard the, the recent president-elect of Colombia, a, a strong leftist, he said something that really struck me about the political times that we're living in. He said, it's not about right and left anymore. It's about death and life. Which side are you on? His home, right? It really has come to that. It's about death or life. It's very serious. I know you all know that or you wouldn't be here. So how about these uh, Starbucks workers that are unionizing all across the country? Yeah? Yes. They're, they're the best things that hit the TV and the radio in the last two years is the Starbucks unionizers. Look to them. Don't listen to all this. Stick with the union! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, I'm not a Democrat, by the way. <laughs> they're, not, they're not gonna save us from this. Catch this line. Don't worry, darling. Joe Biden will save us from fascism. Who believes that? Who believes that? Nobody believes that Joe Biden is interested or capable of saving us from fascism. All the Democrats know it. It's because they're capitalists and they'll choose fascism before socialism in a hot minute. And don't forget it. Oh, we're nice. We're all the working class, right? Nancy Pelosi says, Oh, we're capitalists. Yeah, I know, Nancy. <laughs> I know. They can't fight it because they don't want to fight it because they know when the shit hits the fan and they have to choose, they're going to choose fascism. Don't be deluded. Okay, I did say that. 
So now I'm going to sing about a song about the Starbucks union organizers. This is a Woody Guthrie song. It's, it's called Union Made. Do you know it? Come on, you can help me sing it. It doesn't matter if you know the verses or not. You know the chorus, right? The chorus is where, where, where the hell... You all know the chorus. Here we go, Jacko. Let's take his joint and do a union made.
the union. Patrick, I yeah. Think we're curfew. curfew. We got one more song. Are they going to shut us down if we sing one more song? We have to sing Lavender Country. It's a Lavender Country show. And Jack, I want you to introduce the members of the band when we hit the bridges, okay? Yeah. Okay, Lavender Country. Okay, this song is dedicated to every transgendered person who's ever existed for the last 200 fucking thousand years of human history to every transgendered person who is fighting for their lives right now and for every transgendered person who's going to exist long after these idiots in Tallahassee who try to pass laws against them as if you can pass a law preventing a transgender person from being born. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> they're with us. They've always been with us, and they're always going to be with us. And if they're not leading the revolution, then we're not going to have a, re a revolution. And we're all going to die. That's the straight up truth. Transgendered people are going to have to lead the revolution or we won't have one and we're going to death. <laughs> Mowed down by white supremacists. And then they'll end up killing themselves because the fucking planet is polluted anyway. It's life or death. And the transgendered people are representing that life force that's what's the scoop. Okay, let's sing Lavender Country. This is dance. Death and left the hole in your weary sex is roll. Time to trade them. Y'all come out, come out, my dears, to lavender country. Y'all come out, make yourself a home. It don't matter here who you love or what you wear. We don't care who's got what chromosomes. Shed them male cocoon. Rise queer nirvana Cause 
to throw us out of here and uh, my bones are a little brittle so I think we, <laughs> yeah so I, I think we better shut it down before I bust the tailbone Lavender Country world's first gay country album it's still the best one by the way Lavender Country thank you all for coming out we're going to button up and go home. <laughs>